Well, good morning. Good morning. Hi, John. It's good to see you. It's nice to be here. Yeah. So welcome to our Facebook Live um, emission from NYIT here at mm -hmm. Columbus Circle. We're delighted to be here. Um, my name is Nicholas Dagan Bloom. I'm an urban historian and writer on a variety of public policy, uh, urban related topics. Written many books, um, including uh, Public Housing That Worked, uh, The Metropolitan Airport about JFK Airport, and uh, recently Affordable Housing in New York from Princeton University Press. And that also was a, um, a project that integrated the School of Architecture, Department of Social Sciences, our students who built models for the exhibition and the book. And um, it's a very interesting piece. And I am a professor in, um, I'm an associate professor in social science here at NYIT. I teach in a variety of different <coughs> um, programs and departments. I teach in social science, behavioral science, and in architecture. Uh, and I do projects uh, with uh, architects here uh, on the faculty, uh, including we have a neighborhood design uh, project going on in Harlem right now with Matthias Altwicker. And a number of years ago, I had the pleasure of sitting in uh, in John D. Domenico's course on city planning. Uh, and uh, because of that experience, um, I ended up uh, having this growing interest in city planning and have actually taught sections of that course as well. So we're always working together here on different projects. Yes, uh, I'm John D. Domenico, and I am on the Faculty of Architecture and Design. As uh, Nick mentioned, uh, I had the uh, pleasure of having him as a student in the, uh, in the class, as a faculty student. But I think more importantly, it was an opportunity for us to uh, engage for the first time and really understand how important it is to uh, bring in social sciences to issues of architecture and kind of spatial development in the city. My uh, role as an architecture and urban design professor is about uh, spatial and the development of the city uh, and buildings and city. But I, I think that I have, uh, over the years, uh, developed a real interest in transportation, public transportation, and how that transportation has influenced the uh, growth and development of New York City. And that's, uh, and I say New York City, it, it's really uh, in all cities you can see both their strengths and weaknesses through examining their transportation system and how their uh, residents are able to get around. But in New York City in particular, you really see the connection between development and transportation. So in the courses that I teach, the design studio is really the laboratory where we have an opportunity to bring in uh, members of the faculty that uh, like Nick uh, and uh, to have conversations about both physical development but also the social, political, and economic impacts of what we're doing. Uh, and in the city planning course, it's possible to look at uh, how we have planned the city in the past, how other cities have been pa uh, planned, and uh, how we should look to planning the city in the future. So, uh, so here and, we are. And yep. you're being modest too, because you also have uh, a terrific firm as well. And uh, yes, uh, I have also uh, had uh, the opportunity to develop uh, the studio, T. Domenico and Partners. Uh, several students, right. actually, and former students, are a part of that studio, a very important part of that studio. And some of the projects uh, have included Atlantic Terminal, right. Barclay Center. Uh, the Stillwell Portal building in Coney Great. Island, Great. Uh, which uh, is a wonderful building, uh, an introduction to Coney Island, the great American recreational place. Uh, and uh, as well, newer projects uh, for growth of new cities like the uh, Tyson's project, mm -hmm. the extension of the Washington Metro in Northern Virginia. And a new project, maybe we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. which is uh, superconducting maglev, the ability right. to travel from Washington, D.C. to New York City in 55 minutes, and that could change everyone's day and what we do. So uh, this collection of projects that are both uh, worked on in, uh, in the academic setting, but then also carried to the studio setting make uh, life pretty interesting. 
Yeah, and I was excited to speak with you about these topics because you have this direct experience working with large agencies and actually physically constructing these places. I tend to study more on the sort of abstract or an historical level about these places and their development. So I think it's, it's exciting. Do you want to send a shout out to Oh, our yes. I should tell everyone <laughs> as we move along here, like us, love us, share us, and of course the, the post. And send us questions because we want to hear what you, uh, what you think and uh, become a very important part of this conversation. Great. So. so we do have some prepared questions while we're sort of yeah. while waiting on some questions coming in. And uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how we answer these differently, I think. So okay. maybe I'll ask you the question first okay. and then I'll answer it for myself and, and the field that I'm in. So what, is, what do you think is the single biggest issue uh, facing U.S.? today, particularly related to, let's say, transport, I guess, but let's keep it. Uh, yeah. Well, I think the biggest issue is uh, uh, maintaining accessibility. I think when uh, people have accessible, when the cities are accessible, then people have options. Mm. They have options to housing and opportunities to, mm. for jobs and employment, for education, for enrichment, cultural enrichment. So. I think that makes transportation, the ability to move around mm -hmm. the city and gain access to all parts of mm -hmm. the city, the most important thing. And I think when you, when you surrender that access, when you don't have that access, you begin to see real uh, equity really falls mm -hmm. apart. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would say access is the most uh, critical part of, uh, of making American cities uh, uh, vital, diverse places. Yeah, and I, I guess I, I would agree, and I would say that you know the biggest crisis facing U.S. cities related to access um, is um, the the legacy. Right, US cities exist in um, basically an American context, right, which is overwhelmingly based on access for cars, right. So that when we think about that, we think, well, you know, that's just sort of how life is. But that has enormous public policy implications, mm -hmm. right? Which is that the projects you're engaged in, for instance, right? The budgets, the, the sort of vision, right? Um, is in, in a sense constrained, right? By the fact that overwhelmingly, right, in the United States, right? There's almost like almost no limit in a sense for what we'll spend on roads. Right, mm -hmm. but when we when you mention something like a maglev, people go, oh, you know, that's oh, crazy expensive, expensive right, yeah. or something like that. But when you look at the embedded cost, right, in something like our interstate system, the road network itself, right, and so forth, there's an, in many billions, if not trillions, of dollars mm -hmm. at this point embedded in that. And I think mm -hmm. that when you get to access, right, that's sort of the one of the biggest uh, challenges there. Well, there was uh, that was an issue in uh, Northern Virginia in Tyson's yeah. where the, uh, it was a complete auto environment. Yeah. Nothing but impermeable surfaces. And, uh, and I think at some point traffic became so impassable that it just made no sense and that there was a call to action and uh, that call That's led true, to, right. that to the, uh, the extension of the metro. Right, even Atlanta, although, so there are a number of cities now where yeah. traffic has become so yeah terrible that, in essence, these are places where when you look at the passenger vehicle miles, I mean, mm -hmm. 28 million a day, something like that, versus a very small number on transit, but when people are starting to have to spend an hour or two right. in their cars, they have, it's accessible, but it's not easily accessible. Mm -hmm. It looks like we've got a question, John. So Julie asks, the New York City subway, is it salvageable? Do you think, well, that's one question. And then the next question is, do you think we should stop the 24-7 operating schedule? Mm -hmm. Great question. Well, uh, they are challenging <laughs> questions. Yeah. Uh, I think this, uh, the, the New York City subway is not only salvageable, yeah. I think it's, uh, it's just a necessity that we think about how we can uh, renew, restore and renew uh, the public transit as a, because again, this issue of accessibility. Mm -hmm. It leads to so many other topics. You can find affordable housing if you mm -hmm. have accessibility. Uh, should Not it be should it be twenty four seven? Yeah. Well, before you go yeah. on to that, do you want to actually oh. point out some well, ways you've made a salvageable system I, in some way? I think when I it? say salvageable, uh, 
the uh, the system is over a hundred years old, and uh, you know anything over a hundred years old needs some loving care. <laughs> so it an shouldn't update. an update. So it shouldn't surprise us that this uh, the system requires some care. So behind us, I uh, think it's interesting. The uh, in the background is the uh, entrance to the South Ferry Station. Seems like a very nice canopied entrance, and on the surface, it uh, it's, seems like many other entrances to subways that you've seen. But if you look closer, the, uh, the station was, in fact, uh, ruined after, in the aftermath of Sandy, flooded literally from bottom to top. And uh, so part of the process of rebuilding the station meant making it resilient for the right. future. And so much of the system is vulnerable to right. uh, rising tides that that is a, an important process. So, and this is a case in Miami, this is the case in Boston, this is the right. case in infrastructure. Any of the coastal cities. In yeah. any of the coastal cities that are uh, yeah. in the United States. So there's, the issue is twofold. Is it salvageable? Yes, it, it is salvageable and we must dedicate the resources to do that but we also must make them more resilient also mm -hmm. because uh, when the 11 feet of water begins to pile up over mm -hmm. this, uh, it is it is now closed down. The glazing is more like an aquarium than yeah. a regular sheet of glass. And it's really uh, structured so as to be prepared for that kind of contingency. And I would say, then, from my perspective in social science and public policy, right, I think that's something, the, the salvageable, whether it's savable, right, has to, a lot to do with political will, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we've talked about this some, but you have to have the willingness, right, of the city's leadership, the state's leadership, and the federal government, which is a really important source of capital funding uh, for New York City. They have to get together, right, and decide to make some really tough choices. And by the way, politically, uh, pretty difficult choices they're going to have to tax, right? We saw a little bit of this with some of the charges now on Uber and so forth yeah. on the, the ride sharing, but it's going to have to be a, a, another level. I think the only way it's really savable, and I, maybe what they mean is, can it be a first rate kind of global system? Mm -hmm. the, the current model, the current capital model isn't there. Right? It's to kind of, let's hold it, let's get some, we're getting new trains, there are things like that. But to take it to that next level, where we're a competitive global city, right, with a system on par with other cities, that may take another kind of political will, you know, at either state or federal level, if I require that kind of funding. Well, there's no question about it. We have to have a national conversation about this uh, uh, restoration of infrastructure. And we in New York have to have a conversation also because yeah. we recognize how important it is to our life, to our economy, that we have to dedicate the resources to make it happen. So we have another question related to is I've heard the cost of repairs and renovations to the subway of New York City far exceed that of other major cities. Why? Well, you've got experience directly on this one. Well, do we do. To? And I, I think that the, there have been studies and there continue to be studies about how to uh, reevaluate some of the costs that are incurred and whether or not those rules or whatever right. that generates those costs can be changed. That's good and that's important. Mm -hmm. We need to do that. But I think the other thing we have to keep in mind is that the system is being rebuilt while it's being used for yeah. the most part. And go back to that 24-7. So the 24-7 issue, it, it took us 10 years to rebuild Atlantic Terminal. Now, I think everyone who goes there today says, this is a pretty nice place. We move very easily between the stations mm -hmm. and the access to the Long Island Railroad is, uh, is qu quite comfortable through the uh, main pavilion building on Flatbush and Atlantic. But all of that was done in little incremental right. pieces over right. a 10 year period. And because you can't just close it down and say, we'll open again in three years. <laughs> so I, I think a lot of the costs, the extra costs, are the costs to continue running a safe mm -hmm. system. That's important mm -hmm. too. This, this the over, the really extending yourself to make sure that the work is done while keeping everyone that's using the system safe. And uh, I, but uh, there's no question that there are some costs uh, overruns. And Would I you think you have to do both. Yeah, do you think, like, 
not running a 24-hour system would be a way to, in your experience, uh, to expedite uh, things? In my experience, the closing of the weekend can be effective, yeah. but it takes a long time to close down right. a subway because there's, there is electrical power and there's the, the front door and the side door and there, there's, it just takes quite a, an elaborate process to mm -hmm. close it down, which means that if you start doing that at midnight or 1 a.m., you don't really get to work till three in the morning or two in the morning. Now you're working for three hours. So I think unless it's over a weekend and there's a, a real concentrated block of time, you have to judge whether the convenience is worth the effort. And there also are things like performance-based contracts or, mm -hmm. or design build and other mm -hmm. things which are you know moving their way through, which can expedite these. Can expedite to, to some extent, yes. In situations uh, like, for example, in Astoria now, where some stations are closed and they're skipping some, you could still walk to others. It's yeah. a bit of an inconvenience, but you could walk so that you can do both. So yeah, I mean, obviously there are some major ways. Uh, they also need to look at the way contracting is done generally in the city for most projects. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a big one. We have another question here. Julie asks, I know New York City exports their trash. Where does it go? Is that a solution for cities? Well, it does have a relationship to the crisis in infrastructure in New York. That's for sure, right? It does. And yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I, and I think uh, uh, New York City has made a a big effort to uh, uh, build and establish a series of transfer stations right. so it can be taken. It is often taken uh, by uh, the waterways, so it does not really become a part of the right. congestion rail. Uh, of a lot of it leaves, rail. goes up the Hudson at night. So uh, <laughs> I think that uh, we generate a lot of trash. Okay. We should think about how we can generate less. Yeah. We could. We need to think about, and we have started to think about how to uh, recycle more. Uh, and to use it more locally, reuse it yeah. locally. Uh, and when we do uh, need to uh, send that trash away to yeah. do it in the most sustainable way, which yeah. is probably by water and off the streets, so it's not really moving through our neighborhoods. Well, I did see, I think it's one ton of trash per New York City resident per year. Yeah. So, um, and we're not definitely a global contender in uh, yeah. in recycling or home health or home uh, waste and things like that. So there's definitely a big piece to do. And, uh, and just from the public policy point of view, I mean, one reason there are these transportation, we have a, we have a trash crisis, but we have a trash transportation, you mm -hmm. know, um, you know, certain neighborhoods are highly impacted, particularly poor neighborhoods in the city yeah. with uh, transfer facilities and so forth. But one reason we have that, for instance, is we closed uh, fresh kills, for instance, right. and we closed other landfills actually yes. over time, and they're becoming parks, and, and that's terrific. But we, we've made a choice, right, in New York City, right, that we're not going to basically hold much of our trash here. Um, now, on one hand, that's created jobs in other places. A lot of towns mm -hmm. may not like it all the time, but there are people who benefit from that export of trash. So um, I think that's something the city has to talk about, kind of getting those numbers down. Mm -hmm over time. We have another question. All right. Alice, Alex asks, as the population of urban centers rises, how should cities prepare to provide transportation to accommodate this growth? Well, what would transport? Okay, so then that's, let's start with that question. Let's start with that one because then we're going to start dreaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That the other question. one's about a dreams, the, the dream uh, city, right? I think we, we already have, to some extent, uh, started to think about multi-modes of transportation. Uh, there, there was uh, a bus and a subway, but that's really changed. It's a mm -hmm. bus, it's a subway, it's a bike, uh, it's Ride a share, right, it's yeah. a car share for, it's, yeah. it's, it's a short-term car Scooters, electric alone. scooters are so, coming. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I, I think that uh, ferries are ferries, really becoming yes. a very important part of uh, transportation of moving mm -hmm. So I think key again for me is that big A, access. How you can provide the access is multimodal, and, um, and we, as a city, must continue to look at all the possible ways that we can do that. You know, that's interesting you raise the access, right? Because we can look at something like the ferry service where the city has basically decided to subsidize, mm -hmm. right, that service so that there's more people with access to it. Yeah. If it were the real cost, it would only be the wealthy people on the waterfront. But for right. instance, they're running uh, express, I, I think they're adding express 
to the Rockaways, right? right? Because that is a very long subway commute. So I agree mm -hmm. that I think accessibility, and in fact, a lot of that can be done even for things like uh, the ride-sharing programs, right? Mm -hmm. We only think about passes or bus passes or things like that for um, kind of our big, you know, the, the bus itself for the subway, yeah. but we could be provide, the city could also be providing uh, that kind of access uh, for private ride-hailing companies, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, and might save money, for instance, on a lot of the, uh, the, the call-a-ride, dial-a-ride type services. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely think creativity, you know, is a key element here. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you want to talk about Dream City? Since you mentioned Maglev, well, we go to the next question, but, but, but the, what is the Dream City like? <laughs> well, I talked about the, the Dream City, I guess, for uh, the, the question that was asked is what would, it, given uh, the modes of transportation, yeah. what would the dream city be? And I think the dream city would be one where there is choice, where there are several different options mm. for what, uh, how you can move around the city that you weren't limited to a single option. So that would be the dream. But I think since we're talking about vision, yeah. uh, we'll talk about a project that uh, we are working on at uh, DDP Studio. And that is a uh, superconducting maglev. So this is magnetic levitation is the technology. And uh, the uh, transporting vehicle, which is in use in Japan, so we're not talking about mm -hmm. sort of pie in the sky stuff here. We're yeah. talking about technology that exists. But it travels at 300 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And it can move from New York City to Washington, D.C. in 55 minutes. So on the surface, you say, oh, that's pretty nice. I can go to Washington. I don't have to sit in a torturous ride for three right. and a half hours. Or go to the airport, go, go up, airport. come down. It ends yeah. up being three hours anyway. But I think the more interesting for me is the fact that it could change the whole spatial game for how we live and work in the Northeast. Because with that kind of mobility, you could live in Baltimore, work in mm. New York City, right. attend you have the seventh borough. Uh, Philly, sorry, the, se the, the <laughs> so sixth. So Baltimore would be the seventh. seventh. Uh, you could attend a cultural event at right. the Kennedy Center. So it allows uh, it whole space time equation mm. changes mm. in a scenario like that. So. In a situation like this, where we are we are looking at potential station locations and yeah. how development could occur around those stations, but when you do think that there are some pretty gritty cities that have suffered a lot right. with uh, uh, in a post-industrial kind of world, this could be an opportunity to really take the Northeast Corridor and uh, and redevelop it in a in a real special and sustainable way. No, that's great. Uh, you know, if you think about it, like we're spending, you know, the, the city spending billions of dollars on affordable housing, right? And there's empty houses yeah, in well, Philly, well, in Baltimore, mm -hmm. 20,000 empty houses, mm -hmm. right? You could take that money, right? And you could say, well, let's invest in a transportation network that mm -hmm. allows for people to commute these long distances. And then you get that urban regeneration. We already see it in Philly, yes. actually some. And people are kind of putting up with a system that mm -hmm. really isn't the kind of, mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't make it easy, but people are doing it anyway. So it could actually, that kind of dream city scenario could have yeah. enormous impacts yeah. in, in housing, right? So. And it is about accessibility. We have another question. What infrastructure changes would you recommend to the MTA, MTA in order to improve LIRR service? All right, do you want to take it first, and then I'll talk about some of the policy things? Well, you talk about the policy things, because right. I have a feeling it'll get back to this question. Right. Well, I mean, there are a lot of great proposals out there for those who are interested. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the big ideas, which I think have been endorsed by the RPA, and I encourage people to look at the Regional Plan Association's uh, most recent plans, because they're terrific, this whole idea of kind of a throughput system, mm -hmm. right, instead of sort of the LIR dead ending at Penn Station, right? It kind of goes into Jersey. Uh, and so then you open up all kinds of capacity instead of having these trains kind of butt together at uh, Penn Station, right? So I think that's the big piece, the kind of exciting piece there. Mm -hmm. I know the LIR has, uh, in the capital plans, has you know, widening or imp increased track capacity on the main line, the main branch lines. That's right. uh, so that is, that's, that's, right. that's actually been approved. Yes. Hey, and let's face it, finishing the East Side Access Project, uh, a $14 billion project, mm -hmm. I mean, that will be an amazing piece, I think, for Long Island commuters. Maybe you want to? Well, I think so. And I, I think there are already the plans, as you say, for yeah. the uh, East Side Access to Grand Central, which mm -hmm. would provide access to the 
uh, Midtown East. Uh, there is, of course, Penn. Yeah. Uh, there is Atlantic Terminal, right. which is a developing area right. uh, considerably. And could you argue that area. basically the project so. you were engaged in, like well, the, the terminal project, helped begin that process of developers and others regenerating? Oh, I, I don't think there's any question about that. That yeah. it, it, uh, it's a perfect example. You know, in the in the old uh, 14th, 15th century city, the the Duomo was the center of action, the right. cathedral in the center. I think if you look around now, you'll see a large transportation center as a destination point, mm -hmm. whether it's Central Station in Berlin or it's the WTR in Hong Kong, right. or uh, it, with uh, Grand Central and uh, Penn, uh, which again puts the heat on Penn Station to become so much yeah. more than it is. But I think these are becoming new destinations, and Atlantic Terminal was one of them. Uh, it was a pretty gritty place. It has become, uh, the, but there was this nexus of all these lines right, there, amazing, 10 yeah, subway amazing. lines, and the Long Island Railroad. Yeah. So uh, it was waiting to happen, mm -hmm. and it's not only that, but it's an area blessed with cultural centers like BAM, yeah. with, uh, with the recreational center like Barclay Center, recreation and entertainment now. And with a large retail center with Target and the whole activity that has grown up over sure. the terminal itself. So I think as, uh, as architects and urban designers, it's our role to figure out how to take these pieces and connect them and make them happen so that they can become destinations. And along that side, because about the LIRR, we were talking about this earlier, but the other piece that needs to happen for the LIRR to really meet you know, it's it's America's, I think, still busiest probably commuter rail line by yeah. by far, um, but to really have it have that kind of impact and accessibility, and back to your your term about access, the rezoning around those stations mm -hmm. out in Long Island, Long I to really make LIR work great, right? There also needs to be a rethinking of the urban design idea in Long Island. That uh, I think that is a that should be a big priority, and uh, and, and I'm disappointed that it's not a. a bigger priority for the state because I think the state of course is through the MTA spending mm -hmm. a significant amount of uh, money on east side access yeah but uh, and the state does designate uh, both transportation activities through the MTA but it also uh, gives the right to municipalities to zone yeah. to do their land use planning and I said from the outset that what I'm so interested in is this interconnectivity of zoning of building development yeah. and transit and here we have I think a breakdown yeah. where if you give money to bring so much money to bring uh, commuters to uh, Grand Central from Long Island then at the same time those communities out on Long Island where those trains will stop should be doing more to provide affordable housing mm -hmm. higher density around the train stations yeah. to go out there to see a little parking lot a single yeah. family home across the street is ridiculous city, yeah. 16 billion dollars yeah. to, to build this connection so but on the other hand if we were able to stand up and say but look at the communities we'll have here we're pro providing opportunities for a range of uh, residents to uh, not just um, residents of good means of right. uh, independent means but all residents to have access to transit and live in a community on Long Island. I think that's important to bring the two together, alter the zoning so that we provide for more density. Right, and actually I have a, a forthcoming book from University of Chicago Press on state government and urban power and people don't realize just how much, I mean, the state, for instance, even in New, the New York region uh, is such a powerful force here yep. uh, and could be even more, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's through the zoning, but obviously through the MTA itself, but. Um, through its investments in the state university system, the highways, all these things at the state level could be integrated in really interesting well, ways. I think, you know, we have Battery Park City mm -hmm. state uh, group yeah. that was built, and we have Roosevelt Island state yeah. organization. Yeah. So many of these uh, communities that we admire, right. we think they were done right. Battery Park City is, Battery a, Park is City a model. Is a, is, yeah. a, is a model community. Yeah. These were state yeah. uh, groups that set up and developed these communities. So. I think we have the state 
that is responsible for the transportation, the state that is responsible for the communities, yeah. they have to really begin to work together more right. to create more sustainable communities. So we have a new question from Ken Marie who asks, you both have mentioned students who became collaborators. Oh. Tell us more, and how did these relationships evolve? Go ahead. Okay, should I start? Yeah. Well, I, I have been fortunate yeah. to uh, be teaching the studio and city planning at NYT for uh, many years, yeah. we'll say. And, uh, and in the process, I've really uh, had the opportunity to uh, meet and work with so many students, and those students have become colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, many of them are working in uh, our studio now, DDP, as I mentioned. But, uh, but also there are uh, many others that I meet in the profession that say, gee, I never really thought about infrastructure and the importance of infrastructure and what an architect's uh, role was in designing the elements of infrastructure. Uh, but now I, now I understand how important it is and I'm working in various firms mm -hmm. that are involved in uh, infrastructure projects, not just in New York, but globally mm -hmm. uh, throughout uh, China and the Middle East. So I think that the uh, working with students to bring projects into the studio, and which we'll be doing next uh, next year with this uh, with Morris Park mm -hmm. project, uh, a new station in the Bronx, and thinking with students, and I hope with guests mm -hmm. like yourself and participants like yourself, to think about how we can do uh, sustainable communities, and uh, and and really. Uh, Move, make them develop around the transportation. And I've had been fortunate enough to have so many students yeah. that are both out there now working in the profession, and as I said, many working with me day to day uh, in the studio. Um, and so uh, I'll talk a little bit. So we, I mentioned this affordable housing in New York book. Uh, it was also an exhibition uh, with uh, Hunter College. And uh, as part of the exhibition, uh, students constructed, we, we, Matt, Walk, we, Matt Altwicker and I worked together with students uh, to basically create these amazing uh, models of apartment interiors from different eras of affordable housing. And it was a really iterative process. They would come up with things and we'd kind of work, and Matt really worked very closely with them uh, as I would give feedback, right, on what would work as an exhibition, but also how to talk about these as spaces. So, and then this ultimately, they were not only physical three-dimensional spaces, but they also are in this book project as well. And that was a really exciting piece uh, to be part of. It's important for students to uh, understand that there's a history, yeah. a legacy to housing yeah. uh, in New York. And I thought one of the great uh, aspects of this exhibit was that it enabled uh, you to step back and say, boy, we do have quite a legacy mm -hmm. of providing affordable housing here in New York. And it's something to be proud of. But not only that, it's a challenge for yes. moving forward because we can't drop the ball here. Right. We have this legacy. We have to continue to lead as a progressive city yeah. that uh, thinks about how to provide housing for all of its residents. Yeah, and I think, in fact, we see the, the, that kind of political Sort of, it seems like it seems very messy. I think for people looking outside, right? You know, ne one group is never happy, right? You know, a lot of the advocacy groups, you know, feel like the developers get too good a deal. The developers complain that a lot of the deals which are imposed on them, right, are mm -hmm. cut too deeply, right, into profits. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, it actually it just it does generate real progress. And I think the same thing is in transit. It seems like there's these sorts of fights going on, but really, it's just a negotiation. We've got another mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Austin Hansen uh, has a question. Since so much of NYC relies on public transit, and even those who drive into the city rely on it to help reduce car traffic, why do you think so many people are still loath to approve taxes and or surcharges, tolls, et cetera, in order to improve the reliability of the system? You want me to feel that first? Since you can I got, start. I'll field and then I'll let uh, you. That's good, yeah. All right. Um, well, I mean, Americans generally don't like taxes, right? They've yeah. often, the other piece is that the way we funded other infrastructure, let's say the <coughs> roadways, yeah. there was a kind of hidden taxation mm -hmm. through things like the gas tax, right. right? So there's this idea, oh, well, the roads are free. Well, no, the roads aren't free. I mean, that's generated by the gas tax, right? And the federal government, and also state and local, by the way. There's a lot of actually local money that goes, most of the money that actually supports our roads is actually state and local, not federal. But mm -hmm. still, the big infrastructure projects came out of gas taxes. So people don't think about that, 
right? No. Um, but if you actually, when, when we have actually asked people about gas taxes, they don't like those either. No, <laughs> and when they realize how much, how large they are as part of that right. gallon that they right. purchase, they say, wow, that's wow. a lot. So, so Austin, I think what we have to do is we have to figure out how to place this tax in a way where like the gas tax, mm -hmm. we have a comparable tax somehow for transportation, or, and maybe it's also part of the gas tax. And it's also been uh, proposed as part uh, of uh, other ways to tax cars coming right, into congestion Manhattan. Charges. Congestion pricing. Although I think that one is a tough one. Like so. the mortgage, ta or the, the, we do, there are a lot of hidden fees which already mm -hmm. support um, sort of transfer taxes, things like that, which have been very successful, I think, for the mm -hmm. MTA. Um, and also look at the tolling, right? I mean, yeah. the tri putting Triborough, I mean, this was, you know, again, this is uh, Nelson Rockefeller era in the 1960s who basically took away Triborough from Robert Moses, right? If you're interested in this, uh, state government and urban mm -hmm. power coming up soon yeah. uh, from Chicago Press, but you know, taking that, um, taking that, the Triborough tunnels and the bridges, right, and putting that with the MTA, that's wonderful, yeah. right? And it's yielded Billions of dollars right. for for this system, and mm -hmm. it doesn't. Nobody nobody has this feeling they're being taxed for it. No, that re and it recognizes that transportation is a balance. Right. For some, it's driving for whatever yeah. reason. For others, it's taking trains and buses. And, right. and I and I think that by combining them, you do get this shared benefit. Right. As opposed to isolating them. Right. So, but I think the state government. Uh, study. Uh, I'm looking forward to it because I, I think it will begin the conversation that uh, I have been asking for for a long time, which is this conversation about land use and transportation and how uh, they can indeed work together when there is a will to bring the two together. Well, you bring up something. I mean, the rezoning of land around really high quality transit can generate for instance, yeah. uh, enhanced land values, which could mm -hmm. be used partly to help fund the that transit. transit. Exactly. I mean, and what we do is now is we do a lot of like, a lot of this is, um, a lot of it's direct state and local and federal funds, but a lot of it is debt, right? Mm -hmm. So now we have over $2 billion a year, which is just going to debt service, right? right? Um, it's an enormous cost. Uh, it's, it's an enormous cost, and uh, many of the uh, landlords who live around some of these improvements right. have been uh, the second Avenue. recognizing a lot of profits as a result, right. like Second Avenue, right. where the land values have risen. But uh, how much of that has come back? Maybe some of it should. Maybe yeah, the, the value capture maybe we piece, yeah. in the state should capture some value from that. And, and I think we're getting there now. Yeah. And that's uh, because we recognized how important that is and what we can do with it. Randall Hoke. Hi, Randall. Uh, who is bringing community and user input to these plans? Are we ensuring that a diverse set of users and potential users are engaged in design processes? John, can you just remind them, though, about uh, posting and um, how does the- Oh, yeah, uh, please uh, 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 share the post, love the post, and of course, uh, continue to ask questions. Yeah, these are great questions, they're really, they're really good questions. This so is a really good, tough question. It's a tough question. Who is bringing- Well, I think that in, in New York City, the community board is charged with reviewing uh, policy and commenting on it. But a good example is some of the recent uh, MTA projects have not incorporated uh, elevator access, ADA access. Right. And several groups uh, out there uh, representing ex uh, the need for better, more improved accessibility have been really kicking up some dust about it. Right. And uh, that has to happen, that's, right. that's okay. And now the president of uh, New York City Transit recognizes that, he hears them, and they are making an effort to really look at several stations, all the stations, right. to see to what extent they could be made more accessible. So right. I think there's a, there's like any uh, public policy, there's a formal mechanism right, to register comments. And then there's informal ways right. to register comments. And I think both are an important part of the process. I would say too, the other piece though, I would go on that is that we have a lot of authorities mm -hmm. uh, and I think citizens need to fill themselves in a little bit on the authority in New York City. You know, I've done things on the New York City Housing Authority, uh, but you mentioned Battery Parks and Authority, mm -hmm. MTAs and Authority, the Port Authority. Yeah. Um, these authorities in essence were created to expedite 
right, mm -hmm. to borrow money, to have enormous power. So I do think it, it takes a sort of Herculean effort, right, on the part of the public because they're designed in essence to get things done, right? That's mm -hmm. why Robert Moses and all these folks created these to begin yep. with, is they were designed. So I will say that you, it's not only showing up to the meetings, I think if you want to influence that discussion, you have to write. Mm -hmm. You have to basically produce maybe documentaries. There, there have to be a lot of ways where if you're just going to that meeting, showing up the meeting, a lot of times the stuff's baked in, right? Yeah, but I, I, I think it's uh, some of these uh, more recent uh, with respect to the yeah. uh, public transit, they've really become a very active yeah. part of a, an active voice. I think they're not, using media yeah, very well. Yes, exactly. And yeah. I think... Uh, Groups today know how to do that. They know how to use media. Oh, here we go. Do you want to handle that one there? Ah, yes. Could you let me know the project? What? Okay, this is. Let me read it. I'll read it out. Yeah. So, uh, Lila Pena asks, Professor, you mentioned the development of the Morris Park Station in the Bronx. Could you elaborate on the project and what will it provide for the surrounding community? Okay. Well, this is a good, uh, perfect example of this land use transportation uh, interface. Mm -hmm. And we'll be doing this in a studio here uh, at NYT next uh, year, next semester, uh, beginning in the fall and the spring. Uh, but uh, we're also working now. So the same groups that we're working with will be brought into the studio uh, to, as resource uh, persons. But the, uh, the MTA has decided to uh, provide access from the East Bronx to Penn Station, so right. it hasn't happened before. I mean, you can go to a subway, but right. this is pretty quick service. Mm -hmm. And even uh, Co-op City, right? Uh, even Co-op City, that's yeah. correct. There are four stations, yeah. and uh, one of the stations is Morris Park. Now, this is a particularly interesting situation because it is one of the largest medical complexes mm -hmm. in uh, the city. Is there at Jacoby Hospital and Montefiore and Albert Einstein College of Medicine? So. There is a large medical community there uh, to the east, excuse me, to the west of the tracks of the railroad. The east of the railroad is a large tract of uh, land that is part of what was the Bronx Developmental Psychiatric Center, and it is now uh, the Empire State Development Corp. So it's, a, it's available for uh, sustainable development, and they're, they're working on that. So the question, another powerful state agency another powerful that state most people agency. do not know about, okay. but it's so important. Yeah. So, so here we are. We have this confluence of three groups. Mm -hmm. Empire State, mm -hmm. which has this large parcel of land. Mm -hmm. uh, the MTA, which has this new line that it is developing with the stop proposed at Mars Park. And New York City, Department of City Planning, interested in this, uh, what's happening around the... Uh, medical complex, particularly a large site of underutilized uh, properties of body shops and right. metal they areas. And these, yes. kind of the, they are like, right. why are they right. there? It seems like there are uh, other opportunities. Low cost land. Low cost. Right. right. So there is some thought about redeveloping the land mm. there. All of this could be bridged by what is out as a railroad station, but it's actually a public street that crosses the mm. tracks that finally takes this area that was bifurcated and connects it in a, as a public gesture. Nice. So it's a real opportunity that's coming together here to make a special place, a, a place of wellness and health and, and uh, a lot of activity that could be, the whole community could be designed around this. Yeah, and I think, I think the Bronx notion. has a lot of opportunities for mm -hmm. sort of you know, uh, there is kind of the spine of the Grand Concourse, but, and then there are these, definitely there are some areas that have identity, pockets, of, yep. pockets like Co-op City and so yep. forth, but there are tremendous opportunities for building kind of dense new kinds of communities around, mm -hmm. you know, really successful enterprises like Jacob. Like Jacob, like that medical center. So keep in touch if you're interested and we'll keep you updated on uh, what happens in Morris Park because it's developing. So I believe that is all the time we have today. Uh, I want to thank everyone who, yeah. those are great questions. It's great um, questions. We should do this again sometime. And we ask again to uh, like, love, and share the post. Yes. 
right? Um, and uh, definitely spread it around and find out more about NYIT. I'm also uh, the chair of interdisciplinary studies and a program called Urban Administration, which is an urban studies, kind of urban management undergraduate mm -hmm. program. You can visit at Urban Admin at NYIT. And do you right. want to mention? And we are nyit.edu slash architecture. Uh, where there's also information on the master's degree in urban and regional right. design. So, uh, and it's also a way to contact me and begin to get more information about some of these other urban projects. So it's, it's, integra it's Instagram, DDP underscore studio. Uh, either way, keep in touch. Yeah. Thanks for the chat. This yeah. was fun. It's fun. <laughs>